welcome to episode 125 of Praise. This week, live with your head in the clouds, and beware the sticks reaching out from the dark. Firstly, before you go diving into this week's stories, the first story this week actually occurs in the world of Dol Aishara, a fictional world we visited twice now. If you would like to check out those visits before proceeding into this week's story, go listen to the first story from episode 112, originally released August 23rd, titled Apple Thief Charlie, and then listen to the second story from episode 118, originally released November 15th, titled The Chattic. It's not fully necessary, but it might add to the experience. While you listen, please head over to prosepodcast.com, which is our one-stop shop for all things prose. From there, you can do a number of things, including follow the program on social media under at Pros Podcast across all platforms. You can also find the small but growing online store there. If you are enjoying the show, do click that five-star review button for Pros wherever you're listening. It certainly helps out a great deal. For easiest access to the show, subscribe using whatever podcast app is your favorite. And do go check out the Pros Patreon page that is present on both prosepodcast.com and at patreon.com forward slash prosepodcast. Consider supporting the show there, which will beget for you heaps of gratitude and a little swag. Again, all of that is on prosepodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Let's get to the tale, shall we? This week we have Living in the Firmament, and in the season of sticks. Enjoy. Living in the Firmament An original short story by Jared I. McGee Stereoma, the city of breezes, the great cloud city. There were names upon names heaped upon Naya's home, but the ancient walls that rose up past the clouds were only one thing to her, a prison. Not an actual prison, of course. The residents of Stereoma were mostly allowed to come and go as they pleased. But why would they? They had their own merchants, priests, farmers, thugs, administrators, doctors, as they were, crematoria, bread makers, thieves, banks, matchmakers, schools, as they were, and more. They had their own vice room. At one point, there was even a wren nest, a place where the trained elite wind riders of Dol Aishara could use their gliders and balloons to patrol the lands and zip along on zephyrs and gales alike, raining down fire and death upon any who thought attacking Dol Aishara was an idea worth having. Well, that's what the tales said anyway. Naya would write those tales off, but she saw the launch sites and aerial nests every day walking to and from market, to and from the temple, walking anywhere really. Just because they were run down and full of her fellow Stereomai, that did not change what they were. What they are might not be so grand, but it couldn't fully divorce the nests of their fabled past, their true fabled past. That was the funny thing about the Great Cloud City. The old emperors of Dol Aishara had ostensibly built the walls into the heavens because they could. The ruling families that long preceded the magistrate and ruled without question or power sharing certainly came to use Stereoma as a citadel. But the lore that reached back into history's mists and tried to unobscure the past spoke of trying to reach the gods. 
trying to reach past the celestial sphere to smite, maybe even kill, the gods. More than likely, those arrogant fools built Stereoma just to see if they could, just to see how far they could climb. Whether or not they were actually building up and up to reach the gods, that couldn't be said. Their hubris and short-sightedness and selfishness in the face of their nation's needs, well, that was apparent to anyone who had eyes and looked at the annals of history. Anytime Naya began to think too deeply or too long on all that, she had to shake her head. Shake those thoughts away. The Magistry, though keen to disparage the old city-state that liked to masquerade as an empire, did not take kindly to the lowlings of Dolai Shara talking poorly of their betters, even if it was about those past would-be emperors. This type of talk was sedition in their eyes. It was dangerous in their eyes. And now, amid the uneasiness that was rising from below, it was enough to get you taken. Those that were taken did not come back. So everyone in Stereoma was quite confident of what being taken meant. Torture, unspeakable pain, death. That was the life of poor women or men in this world. That was their lot in life, period, was it not? And there she went again, walking down her mind's open avenues without a thought of where they might lead her. Thoughts could be dangerous. Of that, Naya was certain. The Viceroy's ears and eyes were far too well honed up here in the sky. She had to beware that she did not betray herself. It was difficult not to meander amused, though. So much unrest down below had made it all the way up here to the highest heights of Dol Ishar. As the saying went, if the news reaches the city of breezes, the news is far from an airy topic which simply meant that if Nye was hearing about problems in the down below, those problems must be dire and manifold indeed. She had heard tales of a cult growing, some creature that claimed to be many and still be one was drawing the merchant's quarter's residents to it in scores. It was supposedly human looking, but the high and the low of the city seemed to be too wary of it to fall under its spell. At least for now. Everyone in between? They seemed to be leaping into its arms. But that was all fairy tales, as far as most of Naya's friends and family were concerned. She had heard of the knowing not understanding recent illnesses. Blights on the flesh and on the crops alike. She had heard of the rich that clung to the old ways, becoming less frequent travelers on the ways of the merchant's quarter, fearful of what the knights might bring. A major change when they used to walk with impunity everywhere, even coming up to Stereo Ma from time to time to tour and gawk at the abject poverty of the once grand fortress of the empresses and emperors. She had heard of open rebellion being hawked in Umasa grounds, all over the fields, really. Calls for upending the magistrate. Calls to drain Kalado Mank. Calls to kill the merchants and the magisters alike. That last bit of news was maybe the most surprising. The fields had always had ill will toward the riches of the rest of Dol Ishara. It was difficult not to when children starved to death while the merchants threw away food by the hundreds of bushels. But they had always kept their talk of anger a bit muffled. The only reason Naya had heard of it was from her father and uncle's trips to the down below. Those trips brought news of all sorts. 
Most recently, the magistrates had told the alarm bells because a boy had stolen some apples. Probably from a merchant's stocks. But the story had grown to say that he had taken them from the magistrate's private orchard's trees. Naya couldn't believe that. There was bravery, there was desperation, and then there was madness. Taking directly from the magistrate, particularly fruits of the land, would fit firmly into the category of madness. But the important part of the story was that they had rung the bells. The bells! Because of one boy taking some apples. They might be a treasure in the fields or here in the clouds, but they were common enough among the upper classes of Dol Ishara. They were common enough among the middle classes of Dol Ishara. To Naya, that sounded like the ruling class was on edge. That meant that they were scared of something. And if it were the people they were afraid of, didn't that mean that the people had something, some sort of power that might upend the status quo? And there she was again, far down the paths of thoughts best left unthought. Thinking that could see her and her entire family, taken by the Viceroy and his Mansharin, the goons responsible for being his eyes and ears throughout the labyrinths and spider webs and bird nests of Stereoma. The Citadel was crawling with influence these days. That is why she could not dwell on the state of the world. This type of thinking was sedition in their eyes. It was dangerous in their eyes. And after all, hers was not to question. She had to keep repeating that to herself. Thoughts led to actions. Actions led to missteps and going afoul of the magistrate. This was a lowling's lot in life in Dol Ishara, in the great cloud city, the city of breezes, the walled ladder, the airy, the godsway. There, in Stereoma. There, living in the firmament where the gods dwelled where one could commune with the divine while starving to death and dodging cut purses, rapists, murderers, and the Mensharan, just while trying to stay alive. Forget aiming for happiness. That did not waft this far up on the winds. For now, Naya would look down and dare to dream and to hope and she would keep her ears and eyes keen and open, awaiting the first sign that some small spark had been kindled. At that, at that, she would seek for those thoughts to become actions, whether they led to missteps or not. And she would find a way to help her family and those she loved, to help these desperate poor of Serioma and maybe even all of Dol Ishara. Thank you for listening to Living in the Firmament, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. Please stick around for our next story this week, a little bit of a speculative horror tale about the winter. Stick around for In the Season of Sticks. Thanks for listening to the first story this week. Just as a reminder, I am launching the Artists Supporting Artists Initiative, where some amazing artists and I will be partnering with one another in trying to introduce you to, well, our work. My first partner, is Caitlin V. Photography. Caitlin is a vibrant photographer, an up-and-coming businesswoman that is an artist of the highest caliber. Her photography is all about telling the story of you. Want to feel empowered? Sexy? Confident? Caitlin will capture you at your most intimate during a boudoir shoot. 
100% custom tailored to you and your comfort level. In business for yourself? Whether you are just getting started or a long-standing business that needs a revitalization of your image, Caitlin can create branding images that truly speak to your customers and audience. Above all else, Caitlin's priority is connecting with you to produce images that accurately and beautifully represent you. Whatever your photography needs, she's got you. In the end, Caitlin's photography is about self-expression. Nowadays, images are a huge part of how we connect with others and ourselves. No matter who or what she is shooting, her goal as a photographer is to help you tell your story through a beautiful and intimate visual language. So, for those around New York City, Caitlin V Photography is available for your photography needs to anyone in the New York metropolitan area. You can book directly through her website at CaitlinVPhotography.com. That is C-A-I-T-L-I-N-Y Photography.com. For those listening to the show from farther afield, as well as the New York City set, please follow Caitlin at bear.bycaitlinv on Instagram. I'll put this in the show notes. Follow her, like and share her images, celebrate an artist at the top of her game. Be bold. Celebrate the beauty of your brand and your body with Caitlin V Photography. I am so excited for this partnership and I can't wait for you to see her work. Now, back to the tales. In the Season of Sticks, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. Whether in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, humans shrug off coats and smile as hours and days wax, leaning into the spring and forthcoming summer, autumn and the depths of winter quickly passing from their thoughts. But, though their memories be short, the great orb will revolve and tilt away from the sun in due time. The waxing will turn to waning. The days growing shorter while the shadows grow long. Nights will come to rain once more. It could be anywhere, it could be everywhere, it could be nowhere. But in the here, in this nowhere town, the longest night is looming. The earth has shifted away from the sun. The small town that could be any small town, every small town, no small town at all, is waiting on the edge of the longest night of the year. The trees have long since discarded their motley cloaks causing the yards and streets of the town to be swept in color and the air to be made heavy with the earthy thick scent of decay and death. Those same trees rise into the skies in their proud nudity stripped bare. They also freeze, just as the humans do. But unlike the humans, they also shed the pieces of themselves that the cold and the season of dying requires they must. Long and skinny, knobby and wiry, thick and bark-ridden, their forsaken pieces join the scraps of motley in small fires in the yards and ditches of the people of the nowhere town. Puffs of smoke go up into the air, filling the breeze with the incense of invocations to the darkest night, an offering to the dead and the dying. Today is a bit different. Though far from the autumnal abnormalities of temperature and weather patterns, this darkest month feels of what once was called an Indian summer. Though it's come a month too late and the term has fallen out of favor, The unseasonable warmth makes the people of Nowhere Town let their guard down. 
We know that it is winter time. The Yule tide is just a few days away, in fact. So forgetting is nearly impossible. What with the blinking lights and the stacks of decorations littering the yards and streets. However, the forgetting brings with it the danger that has long made the hair rise on the back of humans' necks. That opaque ink of a winter evening is the reason why all cultures in all the world and all the times have sought to bring brightness and hope and literal light to the dark months. These peoples from all the world and all the times used to know what was in the darkness. They knew why festivals of light and celebrations of togetherness and cheering of messianic scions were necessary. They were connected with the why. Now humanity goes through the motions. They celebrate a victory over the darkness without knowing what it is they are fighting or that they have not won the battle. They go about their shortened days in ignorance. The native peoples that have clung to their knowledge in the face of ongoing systematic genocide, they know. They remember. Their traditions are miraculously unbroken. They sing the old songs. They dance the old dances. They know what is in the darkness. As the shadows lengthen, so do the hunting grounds of the stick men. The caves on the billabongs of Australia have white painted versions of the stick men, sometimes credited with the kills of the bunyip. The northern reaches of Scandinavia blame lost men and women and children on the frost giants' songs, but this is the work of the stick men. The native peoples of the western hemisphere actually directly reference these beasts of the winter months. Some yell Wendigo. Others Yeti, still others Bigfoot or Sasquatch. No matter the name and no matter the monster, some of those attributions are a misdirection from these eerie, too skinny, long-limbed things. They are malevolent, they are dangerous. They dwell in the dark places of the world. Dark forests, swamps caught in eternal twilight. The darkened floors under the canopy of the jungles. Caves dotting the coasts. They are not picky so long as they can keep from the light of day. The stick men are seldom seen, but they are said to resemble those discarded appendages of the trees. They are skinny dark brown and green in skin. They are too long and craggy to be human. Do they look like spindly abominations of the human form? They are tall, too tall. Their arms and their fingers are so, so long, too long. They can reach all the farther from out of the shadows to grasp those that do not know to shun the darkness. The stick men are nocturnal and hibernian, only existing in the darkness and the cold. Places whose winters are milder do not escape these sneaking horrors, though. The stick men prefer the cold air. When those months of rain come, though they may not bring snows, those more tropical places will be touched by their terrible presence as well. The peoples whose memory is long say that the stick men cannot use language, but they can parrot and mimic the sounds of speech. They can also perfectly cast the sounds of the beasts of the forests 
and the creaks and groans of the winter forests themselves. The stickmen loathe the humans and their encroachment on the quiet places of the world. The stickmen seek to eradicate humans and hate their warming of the world and their brightening of the world. So they're in nowhere town. That could be anywhere. That could be everywhere. That could be nowhere. The sun is setting quickly. Far more quickly than normal. And there is one small red mitten blowing along the sidewalk. Dancing in a small gust pregnant with the smoky offerings always on the winter air. That mitten dances and rolls. Drifting into the deep ditch close to the wooded area, off the corner of a slowly creeping housing development still being built. The small red mitten was dropped by a young girl, of maybe six. Blonde curls, bouncing as she bobbles in the wind, down the sidewalk and who is even now chasing the mitten as it goes down, down into the darkness of the ditch. The mitten has alighted on a stick poking up just below the eye line of the ditch. The little girl will reach for the mitten. She will see the deep golden eyes, but she will not scream out. Her mind will turn to honey and her words will grow heavy on her tongue. She might not call to her family that is now making their way down the sidewalk in the safety of the waning sun. But the little girl will feel the terror and the dread that comes with those sylvan grips on her as she is swiftly dragged down into the ditch. It could be anywhere. It could be everywhere. It could be nowhere. But in the here, in this nowhere town, the last light of the day has begun to die down and the longest night is here. The family is just now realizing that the little girl with the small red mittens is not strolling and flitting around them. Their realization comes far too late, as she is now deep, deep into the woods, feeling the darkness and the cold that comes with the abandonment of the sun. The incense continues to burn, the false lights ignite, desperately trying to chase away the darkness. But it is not yet time for the great orb to revolve and tilt back toward the sun. It is not yet time for the waxing of the light. So the cold and the dark will continue to reign, and it will continue to be a time for cold, dark happenings in the nowhere, the anywhere, the everywhere. Here, in Tempus Motuorum Lina, here in the season of sticks. Thank you for listening to In the Season of Sticks, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. All sounds and music you have heard during this episode come from YouTube's free audio library. Everything is being used under CC0 1.0 public domain dedication licenses. That does it this week for prose. I hope you enjoyed the episode and the continuation of our tales. We will be back in two weeks' time with some more tales, and until then... As always, love those around you, tell them that you do, and embrace this life. 
as it is stranger than fiction. Sincerely, thank you for listening. <laughs>